Okay, so I've been asked to talk about this topic, the silver lining, learning from unsuccessful HD clinical trials. Um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer that um, I'm no expert in clinical trials. Uh, I work in Ray Truant's lab at McMaster University, and we do very basic research um, in the hopes that our findings will eventually translate to drugs to be tested in the clinic. Um, but that's not our area of expertise. Uh, now, having said that, we are scientists, and so the learning from unsuccessful trials part is basically our job description. Um, we joke in the lab that research is 99% re and 1% search because it takes so many tries to get the conditions right. Um, you have to try things over and over, changing one thing or another, um, and you know, making progress at each step. Um, and that's what I'd like to argue is happening in HD clinical trials too. So, the fine folks at the Huntington Society gave me this title of the talk, Learning from Unsuccessful HD Clinical Trials. <clears throat> now, we scientists like to define things, so I'm going to start this presentation with a boring definition of the word unsuccessful. <laughs> if you type in unsuccessful into Google, this is what you get. Not successful. Uh, things like, synonyms like failed, ineffective, um, futile, useless, worthless. These all sound very depressing. Um, so let's take a closer look and just ask, have the HD trials to date actually been failed, ineffective, useless, and worthless? Well, we have a number of completed trials to choose from. Um, along with an ever-growing list of current and upcoming trials, which um, the next panel of speakers is going to update you on all the exciting things coming down the pipeline. But let's take a couple of examples here and of these completed trials and see if they really fit this definition of unsuccessful. So the first one we'll cover is um, the two care study, which uh, was a trial testing high doses of coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10. So the strategy for testing CoQ10 was based on a few things. Uh, firstly, HD patients have a problem with energy production in the brain. And this is something that's been observed for a long time and across many neurodegenerative diseases. Now, CoQ10 is something that our bodies make naturally, which helps the process of turning food into energy. Um, and that happens in the mitochondria, which are considered the power plants of the cell. So CoQ10 is just a natural thing, a natural molecule that takes part in this um, process of the mitochondria generating energy in our neurons and in all the cells in our body. And so the idea was to bolster energy production with an outside source of extra coenzyme Q10. Now it appeared that treating mice with high doses of CoQ10 uh, was beneficial. But a couple of studies showing, um, a couple of studies uh, that used low doses of CoQ10 in HD patients um, had shown no benefit. And so then came the strategy for the two care study. Maybe more is better. And so the Huntington study group initiated what at the time was the largest ever HD uh, largest ever study with HD patients with 609 volunteers uh, taking a high dose of CoQ10 for five years, which is a long commitment. Uh, it was projected to end with the last volunteers completing the trial in uh, 2017. In 2014, however, the two-care study was stopped for futility 
And what that means is that uh, at the midpoint of the trial, they're able to take the results of the trial thus far and use statistics to predict whether or not there's any chance of seeing an effect, a positive effect of the drug by the end. And so at that midpoint, when they looked at the results thus far, um, there was basically almost no chance that the drug would show a benefit if they carried the trial to the end. So this was very disappointing news uh, for everyone, especially the families who participated and dedicated their time and energy to the trial. And I can certainly attest to that because my mom is actually one of those HD patients who participated in the trial. And I know how dedicated she was to eating those wafers every day and getting herself to Dr. Gutman's office uh, for blood draws and neurological exams and questionnaires and surveys. And when the trial ended early, it um, kind of felt like it had all been for a waste. Um, not only that, but a similar trial testing a similar strategy using creatine was also stopped for futility. And it appeared then that um, trying to improve mitochondrial function, at least with these drugs, was not the way to go. So what have we learned? Well, first off, HD patients who had been taking CoQ10 for years because of early hints that it might um, work now knew that CoQ10, or creatine for that matter, uh, does not work for HD. And that's a rough lesson, I know. But it does free us up to concentrate on more promising avenues. And you know, if it doesn't work, let's move on to something that might. In fact, the resources that would have been used for, uh, to finish out the two care study and the CREST E study for creatine um, then became available uh, for more promising studies. And um, when I say resources, I'm talking about HD patients too that participate in these trials. So those people were freed up to participate in um, more promising studies, several of which have now come down the pipeline. We also learned that the HD community was ready to step up. The enrollment of more than 600 patients for a five-year study was a huge achievement for the HD community and also um, encouraging for the, the ongoing plans to create a platform for observing large numbers of HD patients, um, which I'll talk more about in a few minutes and I'm sure will be co covered uh, by the panel next as well. We learned another hard lesson which is to carefully vet which drugs we take to trial. In retrospect, the preclinical data, um, the preclinical evidence for CoQ10 uh, was not exhaustive. And in fact, later efforts to reproduce um, the effects that they saw by treating mice with high doses of Co CoQ10 um, were not reproduced. Now, it's hard to blame doctors and researchers for getting excited about what at the time was one of the only options for drugs to test. But that has changed now. And um, there are a lot more drugs coming down the pipeline. And we've learned to be choosier and more diligent about testing in animals before we spread thin the very precious resource, which is HD patients willing to participate in clinical trials. And of course, even if we do our preclinical due diligence, um, it's not guaranteed to be enough. And so an example of this is the Amaryllis trial, um, for which there was a lot more preclinical data to suggest that that the drug might work. But the bottom line is that it did not improve HD symptoms in people. Now I'm going to tell you about the trial uh, despite this disappointing outcome because I think it illustrates nicely how far we've progressed in our understanding of HD since the CoQ10 days 
And the level of sophistication that re researchers are achieving, um, even if they don't have everything quite right and everything exactly figured out just yet. <coughs> so the strategy for this drug trial has to do with the many con uh, connections that neurons make with one another to deliver and receive messages in a vast network. And the outcome of these connections and communication between neurons is that we can think and move and talk and do all of the things that we do every day. Now, the messages are passed between neurons in the form of chemicals called neurotransmitters. But it doesn't stop there, of course. Um, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk, just tell you about the first and second messengers because it's relevant to um, the drug that was trialed in the Amaryllis trial. So um, neurotransmitters are called the first messengers because they are the first to arrive at a neuron. Um, but they initiate a response in that neuron that leads to a wave of second messengers, which then change that receiving neurons behavior, make it do something in response to the first message. And this was nicely summed up in an HD Buzz article written by my old lab mate, Carly Desmond. Um, and she summarized it as um, thinking of it as a delivery man who rings the doorbell, so that's the first message or the neurotransmitter, but then passes the package to a child who then delivers it to her mom and dad inside. Um, maybe the package contains uh, an invitation for the parents to connect with the neighbors for dinner. In the same way that this girl is critical to the parents uh, receiving the invitation, second messengers are critical to neurons interpreting the first message. So second messengers turn genes on and off, which eventually strengthen or weaken the connection between the connections between neurons. And this flexibility in the strength of the connections between neurons allows us to form new memories and learn new tasks and do all of these things um, that we take for granted. Now, if the balance of second messengers is not just right, then neurons can lose their connections and this can cause them to die. And we all know that one of the problems in HD is that our neurons die. I'd say it's the main problem. <laughs> so the rationale then came from the fact that in HD mouse models, the second messenger levels are lower than they should be in the striatum, which is the part of the brain that's most affected in HD. So it was reasoned that maybe those neurons can't properly interpret incoming messages from neurotransmitters. And sure enough, the communication between neurons is altered in HD brains, especially in the striatum. Now it turns out that there's a class of drugs that actually alters the levels of these second messengers. Um, and the, the drugs are called phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now phosphodiesterase inhibitors do exactly what they're named for. They inhibit phosphodiesterases, or PDEs. PDEs are a type of um, recycling machine that are in charge of breaking down the second messengers in the cell to make sure that, that the appropriate level of second messengers is maintained. For, H for HD, we're interested in this PDE, PDE10 because that's the one that is um, most abundant in the striatum and especially in those special neurons that are very vulnerable in HD called medium spiny neurons. And so PDE10 is in charge of cleaning up excess second messengers to maintain the normal balance of, of second messenger levels. The idea then is that if the levels are too low in HD brains, then by inhibiting the cleanup crew, we'd allow the buildup of second messengers and strengthen the message. So 
this was tried in um, much more robust preclinical studies um, than what we were talking about for CoQ10. Um, and the results look promising. So, so these are the brains of normal mice, and these are the brains of um, an HD uh, mouse model. Now these are the brains of those same HD model mice that have been treated with the PDE10 inhibitor. Um, and they even used an advanced method to measure the communication between neurons and found that it was in fact improved in mice uh, treated with the inhibitor. So this laid the groundwork for the Amaryllis trial, uh, which s included 271 volunteers from five different countries. Uh, it began in 2014 and ended in 2016. And what they looked at in the Amaryllis trial was whether the PDE10 inhibitor improved movement function, thinking ability, uh, behavioral problems, and activities of daily life. Now unfortunately, it was not found to improve any of these things. So we could consider it a failed trial in the sense that we still don't have a treatment for HD, which sucks. But we have taken away some very valuable information from this study. So the senior director uh, from Pfizer Neuroscience says, despite the negative outcome, we've learned a great deal about Huntington's disease and PDE10. The trial data will be a rich resource for HD research. We're pleased with the way the trial was planned and run and immensely grateful to the patients and their relatives involved in the trial. What this means is that we now have a bank of data about how HD progresses and the role of the PDE10 enzyme in HD, which could lead to new ways of improving communication in the HD neurons. And scientists are combing through this information, trying to figure out why this strategy didn't work and if there are other possible avenues that we can pursue. We've proven, once again, that the HD research community and family members are serious, organized, and capable of getting together for a trial like this. So much so that we were able to convince a major phar pharmaceutical company that this was worth their investment. Another important lesson that we learn over and over again is that mice are not people. The good results of the PD eat PD-10 inhibitor in mice uh, did not translate to good results in people. Um, now, this doesn't mean we can't use mice. We have to use mice um, to do the experiments that we can't do on people. But what we need to do is we need to look for clues in humans first and move forward only with the most significant and rele relevant findings from human sources. These um, unsuccessful trials are actually sources of human data. So the information embedded within this trial alone um, is much more valuable than anything we can get from a mouse or a fly or a worm. And just to prove to you that we are in fact learning from these unsuccessful trials, I want to talk about how the HD research community has taken what we've learned from the Two Care, the Amaryllis trial, and many other trials, and come up with a much needed plan. So Enroll HD is an observational trial. It's not testing any drugs, just monitoring um, how HD progresses in different people over time. And this is truly the best way to accelerate drug discovery because it, for one, includes a huge number of people. So when, it, when I checked the website last, they were at over 13,000 active participants in almost 150 um, clinical sites with 15 different countries participating. This is truly remarkable. And it's important because when it comes to studies, there's power in numbers. And we can be much more confident that 
something that's happening isn't just due to random chance when we're looking at tens of thousands of people rather than just a few hundred people. It's a longitudinal study, which means that it's taking measurements over time. Um, it takes blood samples that can be used to study um, biomarkers and other biological happenings in um, HD patients so that we can see over time how those things change. It takes cognitive scores and motor scores that give us valuable information about the progression of HD. And these scores and these numbers are milestones that we can monitor in future drug trials so that we can see whether a drug, we can really ask, is a drug um, improving the progression of HD? Because we have measurements now for the progression of HD. The measurements themselves are strictly defined. So we have uniformity across the sites. And that's really important because if we want to be able to compare these huge numbers of people, we have to take the measurements the same way in one country as the other country, and then we can compare them. So that's all strictly um, regulated. It's also a source of people who may be willing to participate in future clinical trials. So people in enroll can opt to be asked whether um, they're interested in uh, other trials that come up. And since recruitment is often the hardest part of running a trial, this is a major hurdle to overcome. As I mentioned, these features are the proof that the HD community is serious and capable of stepping up and running well thought out, well designed trials. And this is really attractive to sponsoring drug companies. Um, and frankly, they have resources far beyond anything we can do with um, our fundraising efforts, heroic as they are. Um, and we can use their help. Uh, and this makes it very attractive for a drug company to know they can come in, they have all of these um, defined things they can look at, and we've proven that we can recruit the people. And finally, my favorite thing about Enroll HD, researchers can mine the data. So an HD researcher can simply ask, I wonder if there's a drug that people are already taking that, uh, for another reason, that might do something to HD symptoms. And a group in Spain has done just that. So this study, which was published in June of this year, so just a few months ago, was following up on preclinical evidence of a benefit from metformin, which is the commonly used type 2 diabetes drug. So they basically took observations from experimental animals, which was all we really had before. Um, but now they can ask whether this is a thing in humans. Um, does this apply if you look at uh, a large number of actual HD patients? And what they found was that HD patients that take metformin actually show better scores in cognitive tests. So this graph is just one um, of many from the study, but I, it, it illustrates the point. Um, if we're looking at the cognitive score here, you can see that in non-HD patients, people with diabetes that are taking metformin actually score worse on their cognitive tests than the no metformin group. But in HD patients, the metformin group scores slightly better than the no, met, the no metformin group. Now, they're still not scoring as high as a, a non-HD individual, but they also have diabetes, which may normally have a detrimental effect. And it's, it's this kind of data that paves the way for asking whether non-diabetic HD patients might benefit from metformin treatment. Most importantly, the data comes from real people. So yes, the idea came from observations in uh, experimental animals, but thanks to Enroll HD, we could ask 
whether it's relevant to humans uh, before spending valuable resources and using up people's time and energy running a trial to ask that question. We can always work out the details and all of the mechanistic um, aspects of it in experimental animals, but when we can see effects like this in HD patients, we know it's worth our time and energy and our funding to pursue it. So, the final point that I want to make about what we can learn from unsuccessful trials is that we haven't yet learned all we can. As technologies of all different types advance, they unlock information from long ago trials that couldn't be analyzed at the time. And the perfect example of this is this seminal study from 2015, so only two years ago, that analyzed the entire genomes of over 4,000 HD patients. And at the time that all of those patients gave their DNA samples, uh, it would have been impossible to sequence them all. But now, cheaper, faster methods exist. And so researchers went back to those samples and unlocked some very important information. They found that small differences in other genes besides the HD gene could influence whether people got sick earlier or later. And this has unleashed a flurry of research around those genes, which mostly have to do with DNA repair. In fact, that's what I'm working on in Ray Truant's lab. Not only that, but the results have been replicated and further refined by later studies, which also used samples from other trials. And this information, this is the kind of robust information that comes from human data from trials that may have been considered unsuccessful at the time. This is the robust human data that we want to use to guide further research and drug development. So the next panel of speakers is going to tell you about um, the very exciting uh, era of HD research that we're going into. Lots of trials going on and more coming down the pipeline. Which means there, there isn't going to be just one or two things to try anymore. And this means that going forward, HD patients and family members also have to learn from these previous trials. And they basically have to become smart consumers. And so when considering a trial to participate in, the most important factors are obviously going to be location, your location and your eligibility, um, whether you can get there and whether you will be um, allowed to participate in the trial. But I'm just asking you to don't forget that you can't be um, trialing more than one drug at a time. And so it's worthwhile to consider whether or not to join a current trial that might take up you know, three or maybe even five years um, of your time or to wait for an upcoming trial that might look more promising. Now, how do you tell which ones are more promising? This is not an easy um, question. It actually requires some very hard questions. <laughs> One of which is you need to ask what's the rationale for the trial? Did the idea just come from mouse experiments, or did it come from data mined from thousands of actual HD patients? You need to ask, how much preclinical evidence is there? Um, what preclinical evidence is the idea based on? And a couple of good rules of thumb to tell whether the preclinical evidence is good enough is did more than one independent group find the same thing? So if all of the results for um, a particular drug are coming from one lab, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but it doesn't mean it's strong. <laughs> if, you can, um, if, you, if you see that the same drug is having the same effects in um, different laboratory settings in different places in the world, then you can be a lot more confident that it's doing something real. Similarly, if it only works in one type of HD model, um, 
then it's not as strong as, there, there are many, we, I mean, we have fly models and we have worm models, but we also have a whole host of mouse models and they all behave a little bit differently. And if a drug only works in one of them, then it's probably not as sure a bet as one that works across the board. Now, obviously, finding the answers to these questions is not trivial, um, but the internet is a wondrous source of information and not all of this information is even um, available on the internet, but um, you have a right to ask your doctor and the, the people running these trials and they need to be able to answer these questions. So, information is our best ally and the information that we get from each round of trials uh, further refines the next rounds of, of trials and the information that HD patients arm themselves with helps them decide which trials to participate in. And if this works, then the best, most promising trials will be the ones to recruit the most participants and that's how it should be. So, I hope that I've convinced you that the clinical trials in HD are progressing that we are learning from each round of trials and that, in fact, we have made excellent use of the knowledge we've gained so far. We're not just spinning our wheels here. Um, the path to an HD treatment is a winding path and it has its fair share of off-course excursions, um, but it is a path and it's becoming clearer and clearer every time we can knock another drug off the list of ones that don't work and every time we get a little bit more information from, um, from those trials. So, I started the talk with a boring definition and I'll end it with a cliche quote by Thomas Edison. He said of his storage battery, which went on to be uh, the most successful product of his life, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And I don't think we're failing either. <laughs>